First question, why does it seem like you don't answer our questions? Well, now's the time. In today's video, Pastor Aaron answers your questions. Why do people create the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed? Why both? Well, at the beginning of Christianity, there was a lot of disagreement about what Christians should believe. A guy named Marcion, for example, taught Jesus was not born of Mary and that Christians shouldn't read the Old Testament. A group called the Gnostics thought they were in the know, but they falsely taught that the whole created material world was evil, and Jesus was only a spirit who only seemed human. Now, around the year 150, Christians probably in Rome together put together the Apostles' Creed to define and defend the truth about God's good creation and Jesus' truly divine and truly human nature. Anyone who could confess the Apostles' Creed could not also be following Marcion or be a Gnostic. And therefore, Christians used the Apostles' Creed at baptism to clearly distinguish who followed Christ in the one true faith. The Nicene Creed, on the other hand, was written in response to another round of bad teaching, this time by a guy named Arius. Arius taught that Jesus Christ was not God, but rather simply created by God and not divine in the same way as God the Father. And so the disagreement about Jesus Christ's true nature started to rumble throughout the whole church. Constantine, the Roman emperor, decided to intervene. He called a council of all the Christian bishops from around the world to meet in Nicaea, a town in the present-day country of Turkey, to figure out their differences. Now, the bishops gathered in the year 325, and these bishops put together the Nicene Creed, to clearly oppose the false teaching of Arius and affirm that Jesus Christ is indeed one being with God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. How much has the Apostles' Creed changed over the years? The Apostles' Creed was not written by a formal committee of church leaders, kind of like the Nicene Creed was. Rather, it came together over time. And there are therefore many, many ancient versions that state basically the same thing, but in slightly different language. For example, there are ancient versions of the Apostles' Creed that read, I believe in Jesus Christ, quote, the Son of God, unquote. Some read, quote, the Son of the same, referring to God, unquote. And others, quote, his Son only, unquote. Recently, scholars and the church have translated one line of the third article as, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, or the Holy Christian Church. So either way, though, whether they translate it as Christian or Catholic, it's referring to the, the great mystical body of Christ and not any particular church institution. We hear about God doing all kinds of signs and wonders in the Bible. How come none of that stuff happens nowadays? Now, God does do a bunch of supernatural stuff, beginning with creating the whole entire universe out of nothing. And then there's God parting the Red Sea to free the Hebrew people from the Egyptians and then giving them bread from heaven while they're wandering around in the desert, and God bringing down the walls of Jericho, God lighting Elijah's altar ablaze with a bolt of fire from heaven, God delivering Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace, God delivering Daniel from the lion's den, Jesus calming the storm on the sea of Galilee, and healing the sight of a man born blind, St. Paul bringing a boy back to life after he had fallen from a window and died. And this is just a short list of all the many miraculous signs of God's power throughout the Bible. But here's the question, the real question. What effect do these signs and wonders have on the people who witness them? Astonishingly enough, many people still did not believe in the power of God, even after seeing these things with their own eyes. Jesus' own disciples, for instance, after being with him as he healed the sick, cast out demons, brought several dead people back to life, and even he himself rose from the dead, even after all that. 
Scripture records that some of them doubted. Now my point is this. God's signs and wonders have not really stopped. They are truly all around us. Pastor Paul, just this past weekend, shared a story about how God's Spirit casts out a demon of hatred and fear from a man, a convicted criminal in prison, through the saints of God coming around and singing to that man. God's Spirit transformed his heart, making him joyful and gentle. But that's just one example. So, ask God to enlighten your heart and mind to perceive the miracles that God is working all around you every day. Ask God continually, where are you in this? And God will reveal God's very self to you. Next question. I want to read my Bible, but I don't know what verse to read. Do you have any suggestions? Well, I think it's best to read the Bible with a purpose. Ask yourself, what do I need to hear from God? What area of my life needs God's intervention? The Serendipity Bible has great Bible study tools to help you read parts of the Bible with questions for God to answer through God's Word. It can give you suggested Bible readings if you're lonely or afraid or seeking guidance, worrying about relationships, whatever. I have a copy here that if you would like, you can borrow it or you can buy your own. Here's a related question. Do I need to read the entire Bible? Is it required to read the entire Bible to be a good Christian? No. Almost all Christians throughout time couldn't in fact read the Bible. So should you read the whole Bible? It's probably a good idea that you do that at some point. More importantly, however, is to read the Bible regularly, seeking to hear God's word for you and asking asking God to nurture your faith. Next question. If Jesus provides for all, how come some people have so much and some have so little? Now, this question relates to another even bigger question that I received, which is, if God created everything, Did God create killing and inequality and hate and suffering and illness and pain and all those other things? The short answer is yes. God created a world where killing, hate, suffering, illness, and death can and do exist. So, does God therefore cause every instance of suffering? No. So let's look at a short list of the causes of suffering. The question is, why is there suffering and what is God's role in suffering? Number one, Suffering is the consequences of your decisions. If you go outside in the dead of winter without the proper clothing, well, you're going to get frostbite. Number two, suffering is the consequences of others' decisions. If someone chooses to text message while they're driving and they rear-end you while you're stopped at a traffic light, well, there you go. That's an example of that. Number three, some suffering is God's discipline. Scripture refers to God as refining or pruning the people that He wants to make productive and better believers and better followers. Jesus says, every branch that bears fruit, God prunes to make it bear more fruit. That's in John chapter 15. Number four, suffering comes from God's justice. There are many people uh, in the Bible who are suffering as a consequence of their failure to abide by God's law. And the prime example would be the destruction of Jerusalem and the exile of its citizens as a result of their worshiping false idols and exploiting poor people. This is from the book of Amos. Thus says the Lord, For three sins of Judah and for four sins, I will return their sins upon them, because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his statutes. But they have been led astray by the same lies after which their ancestors walked. So I will send a fire on Judah, and I shall devour the strongholds of Jerusalem. Number five, following God's mission often causes suffering. Those involved in God's mission often suffer as a result of their faithfulness to God. Paul writes to the Philippians, More than that, I regard everything as a loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. That's in Philippians chapter 3. Finally, number six. The whole brokenness of the universe, the cosmos, causes suffering. The whole universe is broken and suffers as a result. Sin penetrates everything, even the natural world. And here's how the prophet Hosea describes it in chapter 4. Hear the word of the Lord, O people of Israel. For the Lord has an indictment against the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or loyalty and no knowledge of God in the land. Swearing, lying, and murder, and stealing, and adultery break out. Bloodshed follows bloodshed. 
Therefore, the land mourns, and all who live in it languish. Together with the wild animals and the birds of the air, even the fish of the sea are perishing. Now, St. Paul describes this as creation being subject to fertility and in bondage to decay. That's in Romans chapter 8. And that's not the end of the story, however. God created life and gives it a very good rating and plans to redeem all of it. And thus, we wait expectantly in hope for the day when God will release all of creation from captivity to death. So let's go back to the prophet Hosea. And this is what he says. I will make for you a covenant on that day with the wild animals and with the birds of the air and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land. I will make you lie down in safety. That's Hosea chapter 2. So if your fingers get broken in a football game, did it come as a result of God not protecting you? No, not really. Mishaps like this are in fact a part of life, a part of the world that needs God to rescue it. So in the midst of suffering and death, we look to God for comfort with the hope that in the end, death is not God's purpose for creation. God created us for life. And on the final day, God will destroy death forever. This is what it says in the Bible. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. That's in Revelation chapter 21. Why do I have to forgive so many times, even when it hurts really bad? Well, Jesus indeed instructs us to forgive each other continuously. Forgiveness, however, is not a once and for all type experience. Forgiveness is a process that God's Spirit helps us with. If the prospect of forgiving someone right now seems painful, keep praying about it and talking about it with trusted friends and families and mentors. God can and will heal the pain and bind up the wounds, helping you to forgive. Ultimately, however, some hurts for some folks can never get healed. Not in this life, at least. Some of those emotional and relationship scars last for this lifetime. And so we pray for the day when Christ will restore us all. The final day when God's kingdom will reign over everything and crying and pain will be no more. What really happens when I get baptized? When you are baptized, the whole, God's Holy Spirit forgives your sins, rescues you from death and the devil, and gives you eternal salvation. Wow! Now that's something, a promise, a God's promise you can cling to. Will God forgive me even if I don't ask for forgiveness right after I sin and then die before I get a chance to ask? Well, God's relationship with us is not based upon how many points we've earned through prayer or lost through sins. God's relationship with us is based upon God's love. This is what it says in 1 John chapter 4. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. When God adopts us into God's family through baptism, God's love covers a multitude of our sins, now, later, forever. How was God made? God, in fact, was not made. God was, is, and is to come. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Thomas Aquinas, a wonderful theologian and teacher from the Middle Ages, explained it this way. Everything has a cause. You have parents, they have their parents, those people have their parents, and so on. Everything came from somewhere. Everything was caused by something. So, what was the first cause? The answer, God. God was the first and was the cause for everything else. Before anything else was God. How is Jesus God? God reveals himself to us fully in Jesus Christ. If you want to see God, approach God, understand God, know God, have a relationship with God, and love God, you do so through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the face of God, creator of the universe. And here's how scripture puts it from Colossians chapter 1. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, and in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Ultimately, it's a mystery how it all works, but... Truly we know that our infinite God chose to come amongst us fully in the person of Jesus Christ. God indeed fully came as a full human too. Now what have you asked me to talk about more times that Jesus acted like a human? 
So my favorite example is from the story of Lazarus and how clearly we see into the tender heart of God through the tears of Jesus. This is from John chapter 11. When Jesus saw Mary, the sister of Lazarus, weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began crying. Of all creatures God made, only humans cry. We shed tears when we're sad, angry, grieving, lonely, hurt, relieved, afraid, and even joyful. Basically, when we're feeling extreme emotions of any kind. And most often, we cannot control ourselves. The tears come all by themselves. Crying is a most human thing to do. So, here we see Jesus sobbing along with all the others who are sad over the death of Lazarus. The God among us is shedding tears over the death of a friend. In Jesus, God cries for us, for you. Because, oh, how he loves you so. Why did God give us freedom? God created us in God's image, and so we are like God in that we have decision-making ability. We have real power to love and create, to serve and befriend. We're not robots simply following our programming. Rather, we're people. Jesus says, I do not call you slaves any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. God sets us free from brokenness and sin and death, and God sets us free there to love and serve God and each other. Here's what St. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become servants to one another. Finally, two slightly easier questions. First, why are there so many middle schoolers that go to Sunday school, but not so many middle schoolers who go to events like the Spring Hill Winter Retreat or summer, summer Camp at Stony Lake? Well, I have two responses to that question. First, I want to give my invitation to all our middle schoolers to participate in more than just Sunday school. There's a whole range of activities for people to enjoy and experience God. Second, I invite all the middle schoolers who have gone on these wonderful events to do some inviting themselves. When you talk about how you experience God and you invite others into those experiences, it makes a big difference. Same thing goes for parents. Please make sure that you're inviting others to all those great middle school events, winter retreat, summer camp, maybe even a lock-in coming up. Speaking of summer camp, that leads me to our last question. Somebody asked, can you remember a time when you felt the Holy Spirit in your life? I remember being at camp as a kid, and for some reason I thought it was a good idea to bring a book of ghost stories. Oh, pfft. Well, let me tell you, after the lights went out, I was scared out of my wits. I kept imagining the hand of some zombie coming up from under my bed and choking me. I was so scared, I went outside, I sat on the step, and I cried there outside my cabin. Now, my counselor heard me and he came out. And he said, all right, let's pray together for God's spirit to fill up your sleeping bag and defend you from all the monsters and scary thoughts. And so we prayed. And you know what? God's spirit did protect me from those nightmares after that. And I slept soundly the rest of the week. Thanks for watching this week's video. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. Keep them coming. I hope I was able to respond well to all of your uh, quandaries. The link for the online response is below, and I'll see you on Sunday.